The Boy Wizard is a mega empire of merchandise, films, games, theme parks, and just so much fan fiction. This global mega franchise started as a series of hugely popular books, which means that diehard fans have spent countless hours obsessing over every page and every detail. When the film series concluded in 2011, it left behind a legacy for an entire generation that would spend countless hours obsessing over every frame and every detail. This has led to the discovery of some unexpected surprises the filmmakers snuck in. From magical signs to signs of true love, the various Easter eggs that screenwriters, directors, designers, and others snuck in are as dense as a history of magic by Batilda Bagshot. I'm Chris Goodmakers with Screen Rant, and here are the Harry Potter film details only fans noticed. Hopefully I don't put you to sleep like Professor Binns. The wizarding world has long been both a part of and yet separate from the muggle world. Using various spells and charms to hide its presence from the, uh, ugh, no mages. That I hate the no magic. Places like Diagon Alley and Platform 9 and 3 quarters are hidden in plain sight. One such camouflaging detail is the sign of the Leaky Cauldron, which only reveals itself when approached by Harry and Hagrid. When the pair first come near the establishment during the highest grossing movie of 2001, The Philosopher's Stone, the hanging board slowly fades from plain black to an actual helpful sign. This is a neat trick keeping the magically disinclined from patronizing the old timey tavern. It also probably helps keep the health inspector away because this place is not up to code. Don't ask about the toilet situation. There's a reason only magic users are allowed in. Another spell to help keep the magical world hidden is the phone booth that provides entry to the Ministry of Magic. The wizard government is located in an impressive and seemingly endless building that is accessed when a secret code is dialed into a particular phone booth located in London. That code is actually 62442, which spells out magic on a traditional keypad. For our younger viewers, phones used to have letters on the numbers in phone booths, also, for our younger viewers, phone booths were places where phones used to be before they were in our pockets. Actually, while I have our younger viewers' attention, what's a Roblox and why does my nephew laugh at me every time I ask that? All that aside, it's impressive to see the small yet ingenious methods wizards have used to avoid detection. It's not all magical brick walls and memory meddling. Sometimes it's misleading signs and phone booth hacking. Yes, you too can access the hallowed halls of the Ministry of Magic with this one simple trick. Horrors hate it. While Hermione and Ron's romance seem to fully bloom in the final two entries of the film series, there are a few key hints that the young wizards were always destined for love. Hints of this budding relationship can be seen as early as the third film. In The Prisoner of Azkaban, straight-A student Hermione uses a potentially universe-altering time travel doodad to take extra courses at school. No! Harry has a lot on his mind with the escape of a deadly fugitive who allegedly betrayed his parents, so he can be forgiven for not noticing Hermione's sudden ability to be two places at once. Ron's not letting that one slip by though, as he's the only character to comment on their classmates' absences and sudden appearances. You have to be in two classes at once. Maybe he's already finding it hard to keep his attention from his future flame, even with all the Griffin beheading. This affection is mutual, however, with a little detail that gives up the whole game for Miss Granger. In the sixth movie, The Half-Blood Prince, the mysterious Professor Slughorn has taken over teaching potions from Severus Snape. Slughorn is a real change from Snape, for while outside his class it may be raining, Slughorn is teaching his students stuff that's way more fun than Snape's pointed werewolf lessons. In one of the early classes, he tasks everyone with brewing up a love potion. Granger tells her teacher and classmates that the potion smells like whatever you're attracted to. The operative word here, being attracted. She then takes a whiff and lists off what the potion smells like to her. Freshly mown grass and a parchment. No! She then takes a brief, suspicious pause and finishes with spearmint. The smoke that she's freebasing actually changes color with each smell, but this brief pause is followed by a small wisp of orange smoke. Orange? 
Like a certain Weasley's hair? Yes, I know they all have orange hair, but Ron smells the nicest. Probably has something to do with that ice cream truck. Remember when you were a little kid and you saw one of your teachers out in the world for the first time? Like they were at a grocery store or eating at a restaurant or in the same movie theater. You had this sudden realization that teachers were human beings who did things and didn't just live at the school. Now imagine your teacher is also a shape-shifting witch. Professor Minerva McGonagall is the much older transfiguration professor who plays a key role in Harry's life. She's strong, capable, and used to be a high-class baller at Quidditch. At least that's what is implied when Harry gets a closer look at the Hogwarts trophy case. He's more focused on the accomplishments of his late father, so he probably missed that McGonagall was equally honored in 1971. In the 70s, Quidditch was a full-contact sport, and Minerva McGonagall played for keeps. No wonder she bent the rules to help her house team. She's been shaking her head in disgust at their performance for literally years. The kitty cat professor isn't the only teacher with more going on behind the textbook. Though, our next example is far less kind than McGonagall. Which is saying something. The admittedly pretty professor and prolifically published author Gilderoy Lockhart may not have lived up to the hero he portrayed himself as, but damn did he have some fine hair. I wonder where he bought it. Yes, Lockhart is a notorious liar, and those lies extend to his very follicles. When Harry and Ron confront Lockhart in the Chamber of Secrets, we get a quick look at his office. Sitting right on his desk for anyone to see is a wig of golden curly locks. Lockhart may have just commissioned an exact replica of his own hair so he could lovingly stroke it while he graded papers. However, it's far more likely that there was a two-for-one special on unicorn hair wigs at McGoobles' House of Magical Hair Pieces. This one might be cheating a little, but while he's not a teacher, Newt Scamander has had a tremendous impact on Hogwarts. His textbook, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, is required reading at the school during a student's first year of classes, as opposed to our world, where it's the first in a series of films with exponentially diminishing returns. While the current ongoing film series explores the magical conservationist, it was not his first film appearance. In a sense. In The Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry is introduced to the Marauder's Map. It functions as a real-life Hitman mini-map and allows Potter to track others' movements around Hogwarts. At one point, while looking at the map, Newt's name can be seen wandering around the halls of his old high school. The textbook author must have been visiting his alma mater in his old age, maybe even stopping in for a nice tea with Dumbledore. I can imagine them reminiscing about a time when they were terribly written, but very handsome. Set designers have to get their fun somewhere. The profession is one of the more underappreciated, but crucial roles in the making of any major feature film. It requires keen attention to detail as every book, every painting, and every bobble has to help tell the story. It can be a thankless job that requires hundreds of hours of research and tedious work. Sometimes it's so thankless that you want to put the books the movie is based on in the movie that you're making based on those books. You fools! You might make the universe explode from the paradox! In the second film in the series, The Chamber of Secrets, Harry uses the flu network in the Weasley's home to transport to Diagon Alley. Or, at least that's the plan. But Harry accidentally inhales too much fireplace garbage, mispronounces the name, and ends up in the shady Nocturne Alley. While trying to get back to the safer Diagon Alley, Harry and Hagrid pass a bookstore that is openly selling the Harry Potter books. Harry, go inside! You could have warned Hedwig! Oh... I made myself sad. This isn't the only fun detail hidden in the scenery. Hogwarts is home to many paintings that are far more animated than traditional oil work. We get our first look at these artworks in premier film, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Or, if you're in America, the Sorcerer's Stone. Which is not a thing! America! One example of a blink-and-you'll-miss-it portrait reveals a potential in-universe historical truth. Anne Boleyn hangs beside a stairwell entrance, perhaps revealing her former attendance at the school. Boleyn was accused by Henry VIII of witchcraft 
and beheaded in 1536. Though, given how the Salem witch trials went down in this universe, she may have just used a time turner to replace her head with a pumpkin. Speaking of pumpkins, a young wizard needs to eat, and a good breakfast cereal has everything a growing long bottom needs. Damn! Pass me a bowl. Hogwarts students forgo those lame muggle cereals in favor of cheery owls. Yes, the wizards even have their own name brands. Presumably there's also Frosted Thestrals and Count Chocolate Frogula. I'm more of a Cinnamon Toast Centaur fan. Even Mad-Eye Moody can see why kids love the taste. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And sometimes it's a magical horcrux containing a soul of pure evil. You can find hidden meaning in a lot, but these details foreshadow and reference plot moments throughout the series. It can be as simple as a number, like when Harry is promoted to team captain and wears the number seven. Seven is a significant number for Harry because it's also the amount of horcruxes that Voldemort has placed his soul in. The Dark Lord is a firm believer of never putting all your eggs in one basket. Harry himself is one of the seven cursed objects that must be destroyed for Voldemort to meet his end. Poor Harry. He has to die to save the wizarding world, and even when Voldemort is gone, the Chosen One is still left with his true enemy, J.K. Rowling's Twitter account. There's another ominous reference to the series' final confrontation. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, the final two movies in the franchise, feature the very important and very ominous Deathly Hallows. These three items crafted by death itself are a wand, a true cloak of invisibility, and the Resurrection Stone. The three boons are represented by this symbol. Though we learn of the Hollows in the final two films, they are foreshadowed as far back as the fourth film, The Goblet of Fire. Dumbledore is now played by the ever calm Michael Gambon. How did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire? When the Headmaster tells Harry the truth about Lick Lips Doctor Who, he takes a brief moment to look over his curio case. Inside the case is a small sculpture that represents the Hollows with its metal triangle and ball combination. It's a classy piece, at least classier than the Star Trek models in my curio cabinet. I don't own a curio cabinet. The costume designs of the Harry Potter films is both iconic and distinctive. From the robes and house colors of Hogwarts to the retro business attire of the Ministry of Magic, there are many examples of costuming artistry. Costuming is also a great way to add details to the characters and the story. One such example is poor Ron Weasley. I don't mean poor as in poor him. Dude ends up with Emma Watson. I mean literally poor, like financially. That's why he's forced to wear several hand-me-downs. The most obvious is his truly hideous dress robes, but even his traditional attire shows wear, appearing much more faded and less vibrant than his classmates. The uniforms also reveal other details. In the first film, each of the three students wear their house scarves in individual ways. Hermione's keeps her tight and proper, always the rule follower. Harry throws his over the shoulder in a practical and rebellious way. And Ron just leaves his hanging untied because this Weasley don't give a f But what about the villains of Harry Potter? Their robes and outfits are as tied to their villainy as their actions. Despite an apparent favoritism towards black attire, the true color of evil is pink. First we see it in the flashy pink suits worn by the self-aggrandizing Gilderoy Lockhart. Lockhart may seem friendly at first, but he ends up menacing Harry, and then much later, fans of Artemis Fowl. Lockhart may have worn it first, but Umbridge wore it best. The sickeningly evil antagonist of Order of the Phoenix is clad in pink like it's a set of ghoulish armor. Throughout Order of the Phoenix, the hue of her outfits goes from a lighter pink to a hotter and brighter pink. This is intentional as costume designer Janie Tamime wanted it to illustrate how she became more and more hysterical. By the time she's finally lost it completely, her outfit is glowing like a neon sign. And that sign would read, I'm a terrible person in every way. It really is insufferable when someone is condescendingly polite while spouting terrible ideas and being a bully. I guess JK Rowling would know a lot about that. The Harry Potter film series is over 20 years old and we've been left with its legacy for a long time. The recent terrible actions and words of its creator should not discount the thousands of hours of craftsmanship 
and detail that went into eight now classic films. Various actors, directors, costumers, designers, and production crew put incredible work into bringing the world of Harry Potter to life. That includes incredible details and thought put into every frame. If only the new films put as much thought into the screenplay.